Any time I want something done properly, I always have to do it myself. Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to my workshop. Here in the UK we are well and truly into our third national lockdown and so it's back to home haircuts. Now to kick off today's video I've got a couple of housekeeping points. The first of which is that I have been through all my videos and I have removed in-roll advertisements. In-roll advertisements is YouTube's terminology for the adverts that pop up in the middle of a video and I've decided that my videos are difficult enough to watch even without any interruptions so I've got rid of them all. Secondly, I am now also posting the odd update on Instagram so you can find me there as Mr underscore Crispin and you should recognise the hat. Now the topic of today's video is trumpet chamfery. No, it's not, it's trumpet chamfering. Now what on earth is trumpet chamfering? Well, the trumpet chamfering tool is a tool I designed to aid me in the manufacture of some piston rings. And if you want any more detail on that, have a look at my video making piston rings. This is what the tool looks like and what it does is it goes down a groove, it does a little side to side and it puts me an internal undercut chamfer down in the bottom of that feature. So that's what it looks like, that's what it does. Now let's uh, do some grinding. So here is the tool in 3D, here is what the tool does, and here is the tool as viewed from above. Now the dashed green line represents the edges of the tool body, and from that tool body I'm going to be grinding in this black line profile. Now from a grinding point of view there are several elements to this. There's the stock removal of this chunk, there is the end face, there is the forming of the actual cutting surfaces, these 45 degree sections, and then there is all this relief geometry. Now of course the only thing that actually matters here is that these 45 degree sections are correct. Everything else is just clearance, so as long as I get two 45 degree sections in the right spot with the correct cutting edges then everything should work out. Now I'm actually going to let you into a secret here which is that I wasn't going to film any of this. I thought you've all seen enough tool grinding so I came out here, I ground a trumpet chamfering tool but I wasn't quite happy with it and so I just ground it off I thought I'll have a go uh, have a go again tomorrow and tomorrow came and I decided to film it and what had gone wrong the first time round was I started by doing this end face and taking the tool to width by blocking this out and so I'd basically given myself the starting corner and I was going to just put the clearances in from there now because I had already taken this to finished width what happened was as I started fiddling around with these angles getting everything right the grinding had nowhere to go but further in and further in so I ended up with a tool that was too thin and I decided to start again so what I'm going to do differently this time is I'm going to start by blocking this out again but I'm going to leave it over width and I'm also going to leave this top surface on the ground and by doing that I will actually have given myself sort of extensions on these 45 degree pieces and then my final grinding operation will be to grind the whole thing in backwards which will take the tool to width. So that's an overview of how that's all going to work and in case this uh, trumpet bit is still lost on you, well there is the trumpet. You blow in here and the notes come out here. So with that said, let's start the spindle. Okay, here at the grinder. And I'm going to begin by taking a chunk out down this side. Rolling the tool against the wheel keeps the contact point between the metal and the wheel constantly moving. If you hold the tool directly on the wheel with no movement, that section of the wheel and tool get hotter and hotter. And when a grinding wheel gets hot, it affects the bond 
and the wheel can glaze. Now, uh, keeping the tool moving helps to prevent that scenario. Now I want to chamfer on this inside corner so I'm now going to turn the tool to 45 degrees and form a chamfer. I am now going to come in here and start forming these uh, 45 degree angles and the cutout geometry and to do this I am moving over to the finishing wheel now you may have noticed I have redressed this wheel and that has given me some nice fine corners on either side and that's going to make all the difference when trying to form this fiddly geometry now this could be a fairly lengthy explanation so on this occasion what I'm going to do is grind first and explain later but the thing to point out is the clearance angle Normally when I'm grinding on the front of a tool and cutting on the front of the tool the tool is tipped up to give me a clearance angle that slopes away from the cutting edge. Now that's exactly the same in this scenario however because I'm cutting on the back of the tool the clearance angle has to be reversed so I'm going to go beyond flat and uh, that's something to keep an eye on at certain points of this grinding and as I say I'll give you an explanation when I'm finished. So I'm presenting the tool to the wheel at the 45 degree angle and I'm going to feed into the periphery. And what you can already see there, if I bring that right up, you can see I'm starting to form a 45 degree back angle little more angle required actually okay that may be more obvious now you see I'm forming a back angle and also notice that as I'm forming that the tool is tipped up so that when the tool is returned to its cutting position that angle then slopes away Okay, now that I've got that, I'm going to feed across the wheel very gently and I'm feeding across the corner and that will produce the clearance that I require. So note the work is still being done on the wheel periphery where you want it. Okay, so I'm forming that back cutting angle and some clearance. That looks quite reasonable, so I'm going to move on and work on the other side and just generally bring the two sides together until I'm happy. So I'm just going to do exactly the same, but in reverse. And you now see why I required that chamfer on there earlier. It gives the wheel access in there so that I can form the required geometry. So again, Dipping the tool up and presenting it at 45 degrees. I'm going to put that back chamfer in. I'm actually going to move my light one moment. 
Okay, well I've moved the light and the camera. Always risky to move the camera to a new position as I end up getting my big head in the way. But let's get back to where we were. So the tool's at 45 degrees, I'm tipping it up and I'm coming into where I'm going to form the clearing. So I'm going to work away at this, let's have a quick look on the shadow graph and see how I'm getting on. So this is what the tool in progress looks like and I'm just bringing it up these lines. You can see I've uh, got I've got work to do but it's uh, getting there. So uh, I'm just going to be taking a little bit more off this and neatening this neck up and when I decide that all this geometry is acceptable I will then take the grinder face on and I will bring it down until I get an acceptable width. Hopefully you can see there that as this face comes backwards the actual tool width is getting narrower and narrower. See that? A bit of 24 year old vision is very helpful here. Okay, now don't laugh. The trumpet is appearing and I'm pleased with this. I've got a 45 degree angle on both sides. And if I bring this back to its centered position, then you can see the crosshair is reasonably centered on the tool body. So that tells me it's fairly symmetrical. Now that's fine for a chamfering tool. Now the casing point. I said at the beginning I was leaving this over width so that I could take it to finish width by grinding this face back and doing it all nicely. Now what's actually happened is after I've done all this I'm already at about finished width. So that goes to show that had I started with a tool blank that was exactly the right thickness to begin with I would have ended up on the width as I fiddled around getting all these bits as I wanted them. So that goes to show I would have got it wrong twice had I not altered my method and decided to leave more material on. All that remains to do now is square this front face up. So uh, I'm hardly going to take anything off it. I'm just going to square it up. And to do that, I'm going to rotate the graticule through 45 degrees such that the crosshairs are square to the tool body and then I'm just going to bring the reticule over it's actually not bad at all just need a little bit off the chuck side so I'm offering the tool up to the wheel and I know that the chuck side wanted a little bit off so I'm just going to correct that error OK, back to the shadow graph. Well, back from the shadow graph and I got it in one, so that's the end of the grinding. Now, now I'm going to go to the workbench and finish this up with a stone. OK, so I'm here at the bench and I'm going to hone this tool. Now, I'm not going to go anywhere near this clearance geometry. It's just too fiddly and there is no requirement to do so for a chamfering tool of this size. I am however going to hone the top of the tool and typically these old fashioned high speed steel tools I grind have what we call positive rake. So from the cutting point the tool slopes backwards. Slopes backwards. That is positive rake. However I pointed out at the beginning of this little segment that this tool cuts on the inner edge. Now if I were to grind 
traditional positive rate coming backwards that would actually make the cutting surfaces relationship to the diameter negative rake because the cutting surface would be sloping in towards the cutting point rather than away from it hopefully that makes sense now what I'm going to do instead I'm just going to use what we call neutral rake which is a totally flat surface I'm just going to stone this so I get a nice polished edge at the cutting point that's neutral rake and that will do the job fine now as ever I have a nice fine stone here and a bit of oil and uh, please stop asking me what grits these stones are I would have to go and ask the person whose locker I got them out of but the uh, simple procedure here is just to hone this Notice I'm keeping the pressure in this case well back above the tool body. I'm not going anywhere near that delicate edge. And the name of the game here is just not rounding things off or doing anything silly. And you can tell when something has been honed enough just by its visual appearance. Okay, that's getting there nicely. The oil stops the stone clogging with the particles it's removing which in turn stops it scratching the material and also when a stone gets clogged it can't cut and then the areas around those clogged particles have no choice but to break down so I always use some kind of oil or even things like um, paraffin a very very light oil or uh, soap washing up liquid they all do the job so that's it, just to finish this off I'm going to take the most of the oil off the stone so I've just got a very fine, you can hear that's cutting differently and I can feel that's just giving me a slightly finer So there is a trumpet chamfering tool, it is ready to see service on the lathe and here is a clip of it in action from my video making piston rings So there it was in action, I was quite pleased with how it performed and it did uh, just the job. Now uh, I can tell that most of the audience are asleep at this moment. Uh, now don't worry, if you're still awake this next section should do it for you. Okay, I kept talking when I was grinding this about having to reverse the clearance angle and do things the opposite way to normal because the tool was cutting on the inside edge as opposed to the normal outside edge. Now what was actually going on about? Well. If we were to take a cross section of this form right at the root here of where the form blends with the tool body it would look something like this. So everyone's used to seeing this um, clearance angle on the front of the tool but in the case of this reversed clearance angle because the work is actually going on here the clearance angle has to slope in the opposite direction to normal. Now that is the case if we were to take a cross section at this root as I said but I need to show something quite important. As the tool comes out closer towards the very tip of this cutting edge that clearance angle has to increase quite dramatically to clear the radius that was going on. In other words as this tool was operating within that piston ring ID the actual clearance angle of the tool had to be quite steep 
to clear the radius being machined. So there's the radius of the piston rings ID. Here's the tool. The actual cutting edge must clear that radius and that's a rather terrible sketch on my part but I just wanted to make that clear. Hopefully you understand that the angle of this must clear the arc of the radius as it's working in that internal diameter. It's not something you have to put up with on external work normally but in this case because I'm coming in from the side and then undercutting it uh, applies and it's similar logic to uh, say a boring bar. To finish up I just want to mention an aspect of grinding that is wheel approaches and clearances. Now I said when I was doing this that I was working on the periphery. Now by periphery I mean this. This is the periphery of the wheel, this radial periphery, and that is opposed to the sides of the wheel. Now I like to do the work on the periphery mainly because if I do the work on the periphery it's the periphery that wears and when I dress the periphery the wear's gone. If you do the work on the sides of the wheel and you start to wear the sides of the wheel down you then have to get into dressing the sides of the wheel and so if I can do the work on the periphery I uh, aim to do so. Now how do you grind this on the periphery? Well in case it wasn't clear in that tiny little tool form what I was doing was I was aligning the plane that I'm going to grind with the vertical plane of the side of the wheel and I was then feeding in to the periphery. So I line the plane and feed inwards. So the work is being done on the periphery, the side is just trailing down the side of the wheel. Equally on this side, align the plane I'm going to grind with the plane of the side of the wheel and feed in, letting the periphery do the work. There is of course another orientation in which you could use the periphery and that would look like this. Now although that's uh, possibly handy, you run into clearance issues. Look at this end of the tool, even if you can manage it on this side of the tool, sorry this side of the wheel, this side of the wheel is certainly going to be more of an issue and so by turning it around and feeding down the side of the wheel letting the periphery do the work I have achieved a similar result. Well that's that, that was how to grind a trumpet chamfering tool and this whole thing that I've been doing is all about visualising the top profile as you want to see the tool and then visualising how those clearance angles then come back from that. Once you've done that it's a question of grinding it and I was aided greatly as I showed by the use of my shadow graph. Now the rough hand grinder and shadow graph are not a normal combination. Shadow graphs and grinding are much more in line with machine grinding but it's quite an effective combination. If you didn't have a shadow graph you could do something very similar just with a magnifying loop so it's by no means a requirement. The requirements just are understanding the geometry and producing the right angles. So you'll be glad to know that is all I've got to say on the matter. Thank you for watching and see you on the next video.